If you have your Bibles along, I would invite you to turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And if you're using the Pew Bible, it's page 907, 907 in the Pew Bible. <clears throat> I'm going to start at verse 11 and finish the end of the chapter. Acts chapter 3. And if you will indulge me, I'm going to read it from the New King James Version and then also from your Pew Bible, the New Living Translation, just to get a perspective, a different flavor of what it says. Acts chapter 3, verse 11. Now the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did, not, you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made our fathers, saying to Ab Abraham, In your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away, uh, turning every one of you from your iniquities. And then from the New Living Translation. They rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? Why stare at us as though we made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling what the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will again send you, Jesus, your appointed Messiah. For he must remain in heaven until the time of, for the final restoration of all things as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, 
the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. You are the children of those prophets, and you are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through your descendants, all the families on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first to you, people of Israel, to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. May God bless his word to our hearts today. Um, a powerful message. The second sermon that Peter preached to the people of Israel as they were gathered there in the temple. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about times of refreshing, uh, time we all need. And I believe um, in this season, in this week, built into our schedule as a denomination, are times of refreshing made available to you and I as Christians. We talk about vacation. I read a story of uh, four couples who rented a summer house for two months. Each couple, in turn, took their two-week break vacation and kept the combined 13 children of the four families with them. One of the couples was bragging about this clever plan to a friend when the friend said, I don't think two weeks in a cabin with 13 kids would be much of a vacation. You're right, was the reply. Those two weeks were absolutely terrible. The vacation was the six weeks at home without the children. Ha, ha, ha. I thought that was cute. Yeah, six weeks of vacation. I, I kind of felt, um, I had some misgivings about that statement. And, and the reason is because we're in the empty nest stage for some years now. And there are times when I would, I would enjoy having the children home for two weeks or 13 weeks. I miss that noise in the house when the children were around and, and all those activities. I'm sure that a lot of that stuff I'm, I'm intentionally forgetting. But I miss those times as parents when our children were at home with us. I'm sure some of you older empty nesters would feel the same way. It was nice to have that, that activity, that, that commotion, that noise in the house with our children. But I can appreciate vacations as well. And I imagine all of us probably uh, have planned a, a time for vacation as families for the summer when we're, we're going to just get away from the hustle and the bustle and the demands on our time and our, and our strength uh, just to, to, re, to reset, to reboot, to, to reconnect with, with ourselves, with life, with our God, with our families. Um, Important things to do, uh, important physically. It has, a, it has an, a, a market effect on our life when we take a break, when we take a vacation. There are health benefits that have been uh, discovered and, and learned from taking a vacation. And, and it doesn't have to be a month or two months or whatever. Uh, it can be sometimes as much as just a weekend or even a day uh, just to to draw aside, to unplug. Psychology Today, uh, I read an article from one of the doctors in psychology talking about the, the value as Americans for vacations. She writes, vacations allow your body to reset and to be more present in the moment. There's less burnout, higher energy, greater creativity, opportunities for employees to grow their skill sets when shouldering some of the workload helping out with duties beyond their normal routines. Worry ages a person and vacations, rather, whether around the globe or around the backyard fire pit, allow you to turn off the worry and allow your mind to shift into neutral. Think about it. We're advised to let the batteries run low on our electronic devices so that we can give them a full charge to keep them working more effectively. Uh, than keeping them fully charged 24 seven. For your computers, you're advised to do a shutdown or a restart every day. Our bodies and brains need that full charge and shutdown just like the electronic devices. 
And we had better care for the health of our devices, operating systems, and hardware than we do our own bodies. She goes on to talk about the, the research that has been done throughout the uh, industrialized world. And do you know that America is the only nation that does not mandate vacation? I know some folks that, have, that get weeks of vacation from their employer every year who choose not to use it because... Well, they just can't get away. They, 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 they got to do this work. Who's going to do it if they're not there? I worked under such a manager when I worked in, in delivering gasoline and things and diesel fuel who uh, not only gave his 40 hours a week, he gave another 20 on top of that every week. And he was sacrificing time with his family and his children. And one day we got into this discussion about that. I said, listen, from my perspective, you got one chance at this, brother. These years are going to go by and you're going to be a 70-year-old man and regret the times you missed when you could have been there with your children when they were playing sports or, or having recitals or day, whatever it was. And you deem somehow work is more important than your family. I said, do you know if you were to die tomorrow, God forbid, this, country, this company would keep right on going. They might miss you, but they would keep on going without you. That's just what happens. We need to... To think about that, we are not um, irreplaceable. We need to find ways of, of refreshing uh, our life, our body, our minds. Um, and I was drawn to verse 19, where, where Peter in his sermon talks about these times of refreshing. And I understand, and I'll get into that a little bit more, what Peter was referring to. But I also believe it's more than just a, prof a prophecy concerning the nation of Israel. I believe it can also apply to an individual life. For example, the word refreshing in verse 19 of Acts chapter 3, according to Strong's concordance, means recovery of breath or revival. That's what that time of refreshing. How many of us have, t have said that in our life? Let me just catch my breath. Whew, I need, we need to just slow down a little bit and catch our breath. We're going 100 miles an hour. Time of revival. Um, Peter, in talking to the nation of Israel, especially his countrymen, and what it, the events that had unfolded for them as, as a people with the crucifixion of Jesus, was referring to, to them the prophets foretold of, of God calling the nation of Israel to a place of repentance and conversion as a nation. We understand that that still hasn't happened. Even though some will repent and believe in Jesus as the Messiah, as a nation, as a whole, that has still not happened. I believe the Bible would say that there is a day coming when that will happen. We can read about that in Romans chapter 11, 25 and following, when it says all of Israel will be saved. I believe, according to Scripture, and especially during the tribulation period, when the nation of Israel is being persecuted and destroyed, and the nations are gathering together and coming um, to destroy the nation of Israel. They will, they will turn in repentance and recognize their Messiah and cry out to Jesus and receive him. And at that moment, he's returning at the battle of Armageddon and he will spare the nation of Israel. That's another sermon for another time. But I believe that's scriptural. Uh, I also believe that it, it can refer to an individual when we repent of our sin and are converted, we will find times of refreshing, times of new joy, new strength coming into our life. Um, Charles Simeon, a uh, commentary that I have in my study, um, uh, a pastor from, I believe, the 19th century, somewhere in the 1800s. I didn't know when he when he pastored, but he wrote this in his commentary about Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. He says that the expression may refer to that season of joy that will prevail over the earth when the Messiah's reign shall be established upon it. But I understand it rather as importing that peace and joy which shall flow to the soul of every true convert. See the change wrought in the minds of the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. See the promise made to all who shall truly believe in Christ. 
This shall be your experience if with penitential sorrow, sorrow and newness of heart and life you turn unto the Lord. You shall be filled with a peace that passes understanding and a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. No tongue can declare the blessedness of that soul which has the light of God's countenance lifted upon it and his love shed abroad within it. I believe that's so true. That is what Acts 3.19 is talking about. When you and I come to a recognition that we are sinners, that we are lost and without God in the world, and we cry out in faith, believing in Jesus, there is a conversion that takes place. Our sins are forgiven. We're made new creations before God. And there is a joy and a peace that you just can't describe or put into words to the world that doesn't make sense to them. But in your heart, you know it. God has forgiven you. He has given your peace. So the, the first thing that I see in this scripture that we have before us to find that time of refreshing is to understand that we are sinners. We are sinners. You are a sinner even today. That might be a bold statement, but I believe it to be true. You may be a Christian. You may have been saved and sanctified. You have a citizenship in heaven, but we still sin. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 talks about the truth of that, that we who, we have a, um, it for us, that we can um, come to God and seek forgiveness. Verse 9 says, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of my commentaries describes it this way. Fellowship with God requires that we acknowledge the truth concerning ourselves. For instance, to deny that we have a sinful nature means self-deception on truthfulness. Notice that John makes a distinction between sin, verse 8, and sins, verse 9. Sin refers to our corrupt evil nature. Sins refers to the evils that we have done. Actually, what we are is a lot worse than anything we have ever done. But praise the Lord, Christ died for our sin and our sins. It can continue. Conversion does not mean the eradication of the sinful nature. Rather, it means the implanting of the new divine nature with power to live victoriously over indwelling sin. In order for us to walk day by day in fellowship with God and with our fellow believers, we must confess our sins. Sins of commission, sins of omission, sins of thought, sins of act, secret sins, and public sins. We must drag them out into the open before God, call them by their names, take sides with God against them, and forsake them. I believe that's why I can say with all confidence that you and I are sinners. We are saved by faith in Jesus, but we still have the proclivity to sin. We have a choice every day to make. Jesus said, every day take up your cross and follow me. We have a, we have a choice whether to obey the old nature. who's always at war with our, with our new nature. And the fact that we live in a sinful world means that we are contaminated by sin. We need forgiveness. And we repent of that. That is the first step to finding that time of refreshing. Second lesson I see in this text that before us, verse 26 reminds me it was for that very thing, Peter said, Jesus was sent. Listen to verse 26. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, send him to bless you in turning every one of you away from his iniquities. That's why Jesus came, so that we could be free, that we could confess our sins to him, to, to be saved, to find freedom before him, forgiveness. Um, you and I need to turn again to the one who can and will restore us and forgive us. I, I put down in my notes, I believe each of us must systematically evaluate our spiritual standing before the Lord. 
What do I mean by systematically? The word means marked by thoroughness and regularity. I believe as Christians, at the end of the day, when we kneel down by our bed or wherever we meet the Lord before we lay down to rest, we, we rehearse what happened that day. And maybe even unbeknownst, we, we said something that was maybe true, but it was said unkindly. Or maybe we didn't say something that we should have said. There's a lot of things that happen. And when we stop and think about it, you know what? That wasn't right. That was out of line. Lord, forgive me for that. I name that to him. I confess it. I agree with him that it was wrong. I confess that sin and I, I am forgiven. I'm reminded of James chapter 4 and verse 17. For he who knows to do good and does not do it. What does it say? To him it is sin. I find that interesting. Him who knows to do good and does not do it. To him it is sin. So it's not just always the sins of commission. The things that we do or don't or whatever say. The things that we should have said. Or the things that we should have done. And we chose not to. Bible would remind me that and I need to confess it I need to make it right before the Lord he desires to forgive us he wants nothing more than for us to have sweet fellowship with him he's not just waiting there to point out all of our failures we know what they are the Holy Spirit in our conscience can very well attest to what is wrong what we have done he wants to restore that fellowship that communion with us he The third lesson I'd like to share, only repentance can lead to conversion. It's what he said in 19, repent therefore and be converted. It begins with repentance. To repent is to change our mind. It's to, to take a different approach. We, are, we were going this way, we changed and we go this way. It's simply to change our mind, uh, to agree with what God says about us, about sin. To repent is to do just that. Um, I also would like to suggest that um, when we repent, we agree with God about what is sin to us. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It's page 954, 954, starting at verse 4. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 9, 4. So, what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god, and there is only one god. There may be so-called gods, both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God are all things were created for and for whom we live. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Find that interesting. Not all believers know this, he writes. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it and we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food of your superior, uh, that has been offered to idols? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed? And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them, them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. That's why I would suggest to you 
that when we repent, it's because we agree to, with God about what is sin in our life. Call them convictions. In the past, I've had people come to me and say, it is wrong for us to go out to restaurant and eat on a Sunday. Um, I see that as a conviction. You may see it differently. But there are some things that we should not do because we know that it will cause someone else to stumble. And the Apostle Paul said, if I know that about a weaker brother, I will never eat meat again. Pretty strong words. He's encouraging us as believers who, whose faith is strong and we, we, don't, we don't, are not offended by someone who says this was an offer to an idol because we don't believe there is a God. There is one God, one creator, the Lord of the universe, the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ. But because our freedom might cause someone else to be destroyed, because it would violate their conscience, you and I are called not to engage in that so that they can see that and be destroyed. So we need to repent of those things that we might have done, in my opinion, that would cause somebody else um, to sin, to violate their conscience. And then with true repentance, according to Peter in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, comes conversion. Conversion means to come back again. We, we, we've walked away. We've been led away. We've been deceived. Whatever happened that caused us to walk away from our faith, our, our allegiance, our loyalty to the Lord. And, and we come to an acknowledgement of that. We are made aware of that sin in our life. And we repent of it. That repentance leads us to conversion, to turn back again to God. Then fourthly, from repentance and conversion comes times of refreshing. A time to catch our breath. I can just rejoice in the presence of God because there's no condemnation. There, there's no conviction that, that of something that I've done wrong. It's, it's, been, it's been recognized. It's been admitted to. And it's, it's been seeking forgiveness from the Lord. And he is gracious and will gladly forgive us. And the Bible says, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when repentance and conversion happen in the life of a believer, I believe there's times of refreshing, a time of spiritual rest, a, t a return to godly joy, a time of rejuvenation. But how, how do we begin? What is, what's the secret? What's the formula to see that happen in your life and mine? Well, I believe the scripture would say it in Acts chapter 3. First, we come to the Lord. When, they, when the crowd heard about this man that Peter and John healed, even though it wasn't Peter and John, it was faith in Jesus for this man to be healed. They came running together to see what was going on. Verse 19 talks about them coming uh, back to the Lord, repenting. Um, so that times of refreshing can come. First, we need to come to the Lord if we're going to find repentance and conversion. And we have to, by faith, believe what God says, according to verse 16. And then verse 26, come believing Jesus wants to, and we'll, we'll heal you and forgive you. We come in repentance. We come acknowledging, you're right, God. You are right. This is wrong. We come and we are converted. We come and we experience revival. We come and we do it regularly. The end of the day, wherever it is, at the moment that we fail the Lord, we sin, we repent, we confess it, and we find forgiveness and refreshing. Um, how do we experience that? Where does, where does that come from? I see it coming from God's word. In God's word is truth and joy and peace. What is the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, joy, peace. That comes from the Lord. So we need to come into God's word and there, there embrace his truth and have him reveal to us more about himself 
In Psalms 51, the, uh, the psalmist writes, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey. I like those words from the New Living Translation, Psalm 51, 10 through 12. Uh, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey. We find those times are refreshing in the presence of God's word. I, I think we also find it where the, in the company of believers. When we gather in a setting like this, and especially in Sunday school, when we interact, we dialogue, we, we talk about the lesson, our understanding of it, 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 it brings a newness, a, a, a refreshing to it, to my spirit at least. In the company of other believers, I feel a, a, a greater peace and harmony and joy. I, I think, too, we, we find it where the Spirit of the Lord is present in power. And there are places where we find that happening. Uh, the Jesus rallies up here in Ephrata, Church of the Brethren. There is the presence of the Lord in, those pla- in that place. Uh, I hear stories about people experiencing God healings, deliverance, salvation. Where the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is this power. And we want to be there, Christian, right? We want to be there where it's happening. I pray it happens here in this congregation, in this room. And we are touched by it and, and, and affected by what God is doing. Meeting is another place that my experience has shown me is the presence and the power of the Lord. When that message is preached and the call is given and people whose hearts have been convicted by sin come forward and just express it through tears and prayers, there is a freedom that comes. And just being there, it's contagious. You, you can sense it. You feel it. The power of God. It happens at times of prayer. When we gather as men on a Saturday morning here in the sanctuary and just Cry out to God. There's just this sense of his presence. It's not that he's not with you wherever you are, but, but when we're gathered in such a setting as that, there's just a sense of awe uh, and worship and, and a, a nearness of God to his people. Those monthly prayer times that Pastor Bruce has been arranging are times of power. When this last time dads and, and sons and grandsons got together to eat breakfast, but to pray for each other. Oh, that was special. That was, that was important. That was needful. Imagine what that did to your son's dad if you were there or your grandson. Here you pray or to be in a room where you are a part of this prayer time. Just crying out to God and welcoming his presence. And in a very real way, in a different way, he was there. It leaves an impression on our children. And they will remember that the rest of their life. I think too, comes through witnessing. When we're sharing our faith with whomever, even another believer, about what God has done in our life, there's a a power there. There's a, a, a sense of God's presence. And there is a refreshment that comes through. I remember when Jesus was was at the well, uh, and the disciples went into town to get food because he was weary. And here comes this Samaritan woman to get water in the middle of the day because, well, she didn't have the courage to come when other women were there because she was looked down on. And, and probably that was the, that was the center of the, of the gossip that happened when they came out to get their water to talk about this woman. Have you heard the latest kind of stories? She comes there not knowing who was there. And Jesus asks her for a drink of water. Remember the story? They have dialogue together. She's, she's a, shocked that a Jew would ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water. Uh, and yet he just revealed to her, you want water? I can give you water that will, you'll never be thirsty again. And the disciples come back and here he, they see him talking to this woman and they're scratching their heads. They can't believe he's talking to a Samaritan, let alone a woman. And then when they offer him food, he says, I have food to eat that you don't know nothing about. And they're saying, what? There is a, there is a, God gives us something when we're, when we're together and we're witnessing 
whether it's with the lost or with fellow believers, there's a, a fullness, a nourishment that comes from that, a time of refreshing. And so in closing, are you experiencing that time of refreshing? As Peter talked about here in his sermon. I believe it's meant for us as well as the nation. Um, we can have that. I read a good illustration about how we can be sure that we find that time of peace. During World War II, David Milton was an 18-year-old merchant seaman aboard ship in 1942. Milton told of one time when his ship was transporting Sherman tanks across to Europe. In the middle of the Atlantic, these tanks broke loose in a big storm. They were Sherman tanks, 20, 30 tons. As a ship would roll, these tanks would slide through the hole and bang up against the bulkhead. Then they'd roll the other way, just shaking the ship apart. He says, so we pulled out of the convoy. We headed into the sea while the, dark, while the deck seamen went down below to secure these tanks. They were riding them like cowboys, trying to hook cables through. Finally, they got the tanks lashed down. And then the moral of the story. The great danger in Milton's ship came not from the storm on the outside, but by the disturbance on the inside. We can handle the stresses without only when we are battened down within. I like that. When we have things secure in our spirit, and it doesn't matter what happens outside, we can weather the storm. That's the question, beloved. Are, are the insides of our mind and our spirits are they secure in Christ? Are we prepared for whatever storm is coming? Tina and I went on a cruise some years ago. It was the first and only cruise we've gone on. And we were a little apprehensive about going on this huge ship with all of its decks and, and uh, what are we going to do and what's this going to be like? And we talked to a number of folks who've been on cruises and said, ah, it's nothing to worry about, Mel. You won't even know you're on a ship. You'll be walking around and you won't even feel this thing moving. Okay, so we went on the ship, and we left New York Harbor in February, I believe, and two snowstorms were coming up the coast. I was glad we were on the ship because I didn't have to be home shoveling snow. It was a good idea. However, during the first night, as we were in our cabin, in the middle of the night, I woke up and Tina woke up, and we were well aware this ship was moving. And I, I got up and looked out the window. I thought, oh, my goodness, look at these waves out here. And we uh, were having second thoughts about going on a cruise. This was the first night. So next morning at breakfast, we started talking about this. And others were, I think there was like eight or nine couples from the church here went on that cruise. So we were saying, guys, did you feel that? Were we the only ones who woke up from that? And come to found, find out from the captain who was making his rounds at the tables that morning, that because of those two storms coming together during the night, we had actually experienced a Category 1 hurricane, winds of 102 miles an hour with, sea, with seas 30 foot. And so because of these 30 foot seas, the, the ship couldn't stay on top. It would be going down into a trough until the next one hit. I want to report to you that was the last night that we had any problem with the boat. I would really like to go on a cruise again. We haven't done it, but I'd really like to try that again. It, it, was, it was fun. Um, after the first night. <clears throat> it really wasn't that bad. It really wasn't. But it was for me because I was thinking this, I won't even know anything. And that'd be... Rockabye baby. Well, God bless Don. Maybe my insides weren't as secure as Don's were that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think that works either. I don't know. We'll find out. Anyway, the, the point of the, of the story is simply this. We're going to be on seas that are rough, beloved, as Christians. You can count on it. You're going to have trials and tribulations in your life. And the only way to get through these storms is to make sure that on the inside, our hearts, our spirits, our minds are secure in Christ Jesus. And as we go along on this journey and we're made aware as we fellowship with the Lord, something, Mel, that you did there or you, something you didn't do that I wanted you to. I even, 
I even convicted you to make sure you speak to that person and you chose not to. Mel, that was, that was wrong. And I confess it to the Lord and say, you're right, Lord. That, that was wrong. It was sin. And I asked for forgiveness. And God, being the gracious God that he is, full of grace and mercy, abundantly pardons our sins and restores that sweet communion with us, that gentle fellowship. We will find times of refreshing when we are willing, humble enough to admit our faults, our sins in life and confess them when they're made known to us. Um, Peter was encouraging his people to come to the Lord Jesus, to welcome him as the Messiah when they would find times of refreshing. Some did, a number did, but many, the nation as a whole has yet to find that repentance and conversion. I don't know where you are, my friend, if you know the Lord Jesus as Savior. If you don't, I would only imagine you're having some rough seas in your life because you don't have hope. There is no peace, but you can have that today by just asking Jesus to come into your heart. Welcome him to be Lord of your life. If you, as a believer and myself, are made aware that we have sinned before the presence of God, in things we've committed, things we've omitted. He would invite us to confess those things freely to him, to agree with him, to repent, and we will be converted. We will be changed. We'll restore that fellowship. and We will find peace, and there will be harmony, no condemnation, as we stand in, our, in the presence of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this, this sermon that Peter preached. And Lord, though I believe it has a greater meaning, that's still yet to be um, revealed, fulfilled. It also has a personal meaning to each of us in this room or wherever we are. That if we will repent of our sins, we will be converted and we will find that time of refreshing. And Lord, in this world, we need times of refreshing. That's why we take vacations to try to unplug, to get away, to turn it off, to, to somehow fall off the grid. But if we don't know Jesus, there is no peace. We can be distracted for a time, but when we come back to reality, those problems are still there that condemnation in our spirit because, well, because we haven't received Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, if, if that's true in one person's case sitting here today or listening to my voice, I pray right where they are, they would bow their hearts and their heads and, and ask you to come in, to, to repent, to agree with you that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. And one has been provided the only one who can take away our sins and remove our condemnation before you. And you will welcome us in as children. The promises that your son are ours to know, to enjoy, and to believe, to receive. I pray for camp meeting, Lord, as it begins today. Always a time of drawing near to God, church to to reawaken to the call that he has on their life, on their ministry, on their effort are no different. We need to hear the call of you on our life again, anew, afresh. And we, Lord, need to recommit ourselves to doing the will you've called us to do here in our community in our families, wherever we find ourselves day by day. Thank you, Lord, for those times of refreshing. Thank you, Lord, for that time we can stop and catch our breath. I know I need that, Lord. I believe we all do. And you provide that time that 
is unlike any other the world can experience. It's a peace. It comes from you. It's a peace that we can feel. We can believe. So I pray your blessing on this, your people. And Father, if there's one that needs to confess a known sin, you've made, it, you've made them well aware right here this morning that there's something that's not right. Lord, you would invite them to come just as they are. You know all about them. There's nothing hidden that you don't know. And just to confess it and to forsake it and to know forgiveness and peace. Lord, I pray everyone would know that this place up front here is always open to those who want to seek God. And even where we stand as we come to the close of the service week, you're there. You're here in this room. You're here to bring healing and forgiveness. Do it to this, this moment is what I pray. In the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. from heaven.
Father God, we pray that you would hear us from heaven. We believe that you do. You delight in the prayers of your children. I believe you're here, Lord, and you're, you're calling out to us. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You want us to know your rest, Lord, and that rest is found in knowing you. And I know that even in my life and many around the world, perhaps even some here today, have been pursuing that rest, a place for peace, to just ease our troubled minds and hearts. And we spend countless thousands of dollars to try to obtain the peace, but it always eludes us. That is until we come to Jesus. And we just lay our burdens at his feet. And we believe that he is able to take those burdens and he will re replace them with his peace. I pray that would be the experience of everyone here today. That as they go and as they are planning for times to just get away, Lord, nothing wrong with that. But to know that, Lord, you would, re would desire, first of all, they come to you and know the God of peace and find real peace, lasting peace, perfect peace. Go with us into this week. Pray for our nation. Pray for those who are sick. Lord, those who aren't feeling well today, let you would just be near to them. Uh, bring healing according to your will. Raise them up again. Father, help us to be the witness you've called us to be. Those who are filled with joy and peace as we exhibit the fruit of your spirit. And we'll give you the praise, O oh God, and all the glory. For you alone are worthy. You alone, O oh God. You alone are worthy. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, is what we pray. And everyone said, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Go in peace and serve your king.